Well, welcome back everyone. So our next presentation will be by Gianni um, on observations of the 21 centimeter uh, line from cosmic um, hydrogen. So Gianni is currently a research staff at the Institute of Radio Astronomy in Bologna in Italy and is also a visiting professor at Rhodes here in South Africa. His main research activities is 21 center cosmology um, in which he uses the redshift, redshift 21 line, uh, centimeter line um, emission from neutral hydrogen as a probe to study the formation of the first structures in the universe and consequently the evolution of intergalactic uh, medium. Now in order to do this, Gianni and his colleagues have been using individual dipoles as well as large interferometric, interferometric arrays um, at low frequen radio frequencies in the pursuit of this elusive cosmological signal. So Gianni, please enlighten us. Thank you very much, Ruby. Well, thanks everyone. Very happy to be here today. And so my talk will be um, uh, an overview of, uh, like Ruby mentioned, observation of the 21 centimeter signal and follows up on, on, Rube, on um, Anastasia's lecture on the theory and will go a bit through more the observational side of it. So again, like Anastasia said, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, the 21 centimeter line is the uh, spin flip transition, right? Where you move from, uh, well, you move, an, at an hydrogen atom moves from the configuration of the parallel spin between the proton and the electron into the more, the fundamental state of the, um, um, <clears throat> of the anti-parallel spin. And in doing so, it emits a, a spectral line at a rest frequency of uh, pointing, uh, 14, 20, 21 megahertz, which corresponds to a lambda of 21 centimeters. So if you think about a lambda of 21 centimeters, which is very common to, uh, for instance, Mirkit observations, as most of you have heard or must have heard during this week, it's about, it's about the length of your open, well, it's a bit more of your open hand, okay? And so it's visible uh, typically in the, in the radio band. Okay, now, uh, what is the difference here is that when you have, uh, when this line is emitted from, like Anastasia told us before, from the cloud at, a, at, a, at cosmological distances from us, it undergoes the cosmological recession and so we we'll call it cosmological redshift. The rest frame lambda zero frequency is redshift is stretched to longer wavelength lambda, and that depends upon the redshift of the source, the emitting source. And this is, I believe most of the people are familiar with this, but just to recap this, because, well, that tells us from the very high Hatch universe, as, as Anastasia shows, showed before, where we expect to observe uh, um, the neutron, the 21 centimeter emission. So if you go redshift six, you expect it to, well, you will observe it at 200 megahertz, so the very starting very low frequencies, and, and so on and so forth. Redshift no, 9 is going to be 140, 18, 78 megahertz. Sorry, that should be 74, apologies. And 27 it should be around 50 megahertz. So you go to the very low uh, frequency part of the radio spectrum, okay? And uh, when you observe it in your local universe, um, uh, you have, you typically see, for instance, um, lines like this one, right? You observe less, this flux density as a function of wavelength. You see center at 21 centimeters something. You've got a profile here and then and then and then no emission. Obviously this lines the, the, the flux density of the line as well as the width as well as the exact position of the peak they tell us about the physics of the object that emits. That's a bit different in the cosmological uh, uh, context because rather than expecting a line, you must you perhaps remember this from Anastasia's presentation before, well, a line emitted at each single redshift right, appears slightly uh, at slight different frequencies. So if you have a continuum emission, not a continuum, but sorry, if you have clouds that emit at the continued redshift uh, distribution, you actually don't expect to observe a line, but you expect to observe something more like a continuum of emission that, that looks like the following one. You've seen, you may remember this from 
Anastasia slides before. So, okay, so if you have a mission from neutral hydrogen, let's say from redshift in this case, six here, all the way up to whatever you want, because the universe was, the intergalactic medium was neutral. Well, then you have, well, this is not neutral, it's very nice, but when it was neutral, then you have for each redshift, you expect no an emission. And so rather than looking at a standard line here, we're looking at something that has continuous emission across redshift and the four across frequencies. Right, this is the familiar frequency redshift that I, well, the familiar the frequency redshift that I, that I try to <clears throat> make us familiar with right now. Okay. Um, what does the signal look like? Anastasia showed us something. It's a bit unusual for, for standard radio astronomers, uh, in the sense that standard radio astronomers are used to something like this. This is a low for, I take this example from low for one of the current telescopes at low frequencies. It's a large field. You can see they put here the full moon as a comparison, several degrees across in the sky. And all these dots are radio sources that, that some of you may be familiar with, you heard, uh, at least in this week. So there is the scale of the problem here. These are degrees in the sky. Then if you make a zoom in in various areas, you can see that you no, know, there are a lot of small dots in the radio sources here, but these radio sources have structures most of the time. You can see here is the standard nucleus with the two jets. Some of them don't really have this like two symmetric jets, but they have jets that curve and bend over, narrow and wide, on a mission that are on scales of degrees or, sorry, arc minutes or perhaps even arc seconds. Some of the fields look more complicated. So we are used to something like this, nevertheless, where you have like most of the sky is empty, you can see it's dark. Uh, and, and then you have some high signal to noise emission, either a compact source or slightly extended or something like this. So this is different in cosmology, because like Anastasia showed, our signal, the signal that we're looking uh, for is similar mostly to this. Now, this is one of the many simulations. And there are three slices up here. Uh, just just, just not, not going to go into the details. It's, it's the look that matters here. So it's redshift 11, 9, and 17. If you move down, uh, you can see what is important is to see that these black areas are where the hydrogen is ionized. And so, and so there is no 21 centimeter line emission because the electron was stripped off, right? Or you can see that as reionization progresses at the beginning, you have a lot of signal everywhere, then you have a lot of zeros, and then more zeros until probably is everything zero at some point. But what matters here is that this is, again, a cosmological simulation of, um, a, don't remember exactly, but probably a few hundred megaparsecs across. Right? Hope people are familiar with megaparsecs. Uh, the, 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 the color scale shows the, the intensity of the signal. So red is, is bright. And like Anastasia mentioned before, right, you go zero all the way down to, to blue is zero. You can see that it's everywhere, right? everywhere in your in your simulation uh, on different scales you know, right you see this this hydrogen bubbles that sometimes are here are small and then they grow larger and larger here until they are not even longer bubbles but they're just larger areas in the cosmic ball so the idea so, so we're looking at something that if you, if you like in, in you've you've had in this week um, lectures about this so I can already call it the beam your telescope beam right? Falls completely a beam. It's essentially everywhere. Well, it doesn't have a specific location like it could have. No, could be for a galactic center, specific radio source or pulse. And there's scales in the mission that range from a few arc minutes all the way up to degrees. An example you can see in this. It's, Anastasia shows this before too. And this is the map of the cosmic micro background to the Big Bang relic, if you want. And it's the picture of the universe when it, when it was only three hundred thousand years old. And you can see that in this picture, this if we were, this is what we call in the galactic projection. So if we were looking at our galaxy, the galactic plane would look like here, like a band, a horizontal band in here. And you can see here there is essentially signal everywhere. You have the, the, the cold, sorry, the, the the bright spot that are red, the cold are black are blue, cold and, and, and bright with respect to what? With the average temperature that was subtracted out here the 2.728 Kelvin. Um, but so essentially, it's, similar, it's a very similar concept. You have a mission that is everywhere, 
and ranges on large serves, um, range of scales, okay? And so what we want to measure eventually is, is this, right? We want to observe the intensity of the signal as a function of position, if you want X and Y, or angle in the sky, and as a function of latitude. In other words, we call it the spatial evolution of the 21 centimeter signal. No, spatial evolution means how it changes. You can see that it changes with, this, with position in the sky as a function of redshift, so as the universe changes and evolves. Okay? So that would be our, let's say, prime observable. Uh, but, but, but there are, like Anastasia mentioned before, some, some, some variations on this picture. Uh, if you don't really care about how the, the, this, the, the small scales or the less the scales of the problems are, where they have an ionized region here or there, you can only, for instance, measure how the evolution of, the, uh, of your signal is this function of redshift, okay? Which is the bottom line before, Anastasia showed this, you express something like this. Um, and if you want to do this, you don't need angular resolution, you can just build some relatively simple dipoles like this one. Uh, and just as matters, what is important is that they are sensitive to those wavelengths. So you've got just large dipoles normally, like a meter or two meter wide dipoles. You put it on the ground. Here in this picture, this picture shows the emission from the galaxy. You can see the galactic center at 480, sorry, 408 megahertz here. And your beam is as large as these contours here. So you arch pixels on the sky, you integrate over all these pixels. Essentially, you hardly have, you can probably put two pixels on the skies. You can't really make a map. And, uh, and, uh, and so essentially, you measure the spectrum, what we call the sky average or global signal. And you'll hear about this. You've heard a bit of Anastasia, and Martha's and the lawyer are going to talk about this much, much more, much more detail later. So I won't done well on this. Moving forward now, okay, what, what do I need to do if I really want to measure the intensity? It's a function of position and direction. Well, uh, I, for instance, want to certainly measure the typical size or observe the typical size of ionized bubbles. The bubbles evolve as a function of redshift. And remember that a certain scale has a different, subten a different solid angle at different distances, right? So something that is physically a few kiloparsec across subtends a different angle, right? If it's nearby, it's very far away. So if you have something like at 11, you can expect that a few megaparsecs turns into a few minutes. At redshift 8, when you may have large bubbles, because the realization grow, can go up to tens of arc minutes, uh, because you have bubbles that are the largest one could be hundreds of megaparsecs, just to give you an idea. Obviously, you, can, you have signals in even larger scales, so the degrees, and then you can have signal on very small scales. How small? Well, almost as small as you can. Obviously, obviously galaxies are probably a few kiloparsecs size, so don't want to go and resolve the kiloparsecs, but you, know, you have a large range of scales. That's true for, for simulations, but also for observations. And if you keep in mind that the 100 meter dish has about a degree resolution at 150 megahertz, you, know, you see that, so which is redshift eight, so you see that you need, if you want to measure the structure and the evolution, you need angular resolution. So you, that's why we build it different, right? Uh, that's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. Now, if you want to make an image of a signal, you need angular resolution. Single dish cannot provide you that, right? Or, or dipole, if you want. Before. What should kind of interferometer you want to measure? Well, before we move into that, we talked about images, but images is not the only thing you want to do. Don't say this out loud because probably most of the week was spent in talking about how you make images and nice images of the sky. When you have a signal like this one, the CMB in the 21 centimeter that fills your beam, right? And has some properties, right? It is more true for the CMB than the 21 centimeter signal. We say that it's homogeneous and isotopic. What does that mean? Uh, well, essentially it means that it doesn't matter where you look, right? Uh, that much, uh, and uh, and it's, so if you look in this direction or this direction, why does it doesn't matter that much? Because most of the time the theory cannot tell you what the actual emission is going to be in this picture. But your theory is a statistical theory and can only tell you essentially something that something about the statistics of your signal. What this variance is, 
what the distribution of the signal is. Or in other words, what your power spectrum is, right? So you move from the idea of making images to actually asking yourself, what is the statistical distribution of the signal of my power? Power spectrum is then more or less defined all the same way, and as Stasia mentioned it before, you have an image, it's I, you take the Fourier transfer here, indicated with the tilde, you multiply the Fourier transfer by its complex conjugate, and this way you get rid of the phases. If you get rid of the phases, as you must have seen, you've seen it this week, you get rid of the position of the sky. It doesn't really matter what is that location of the sky. Only what matters eventually is how much power, how much amplitude there is there of my signal. And this, this brackets here indicate that you average over, well, over what at this point, if it doesn't really matter in which direction you're looking, it only doesn't matter what or the orientation of your length is. So the only important thing is the length right, of your scale. Whether you scale this, is this, is this, doesn't really matter. That's why we say it's isotropic. It doesn't matter the orientation. And so essentially, you measure the power on a certain length of your vector okay, on the sky. Uh, I, I give you an intuition of power spectrum. I think perhaps most of you may have heard of it, but sometimes it's counterintuitive. And so let's go quick into this. So this is a very famous image of a duck. <laughs> so if you have a, right, let's take this example. And I, 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 I didn't put a lot of credits to the lecture here, but this especially goes to Griffin Foster for, for, for coming up with this great example, for me at least. So you have a duck here. Now, if you take the Fourier transform of this image, take the Fourier transform of the duck, Fourier transform is a complex number, and you can plot the amplitude and phases. And there you are. So the amplitude you can see here, um, and, and if you, I, I, I challenge you, if I just, just look at these two things, the amplitude and the phase, to understand that you would be looking at the Fourier transform of the duck, right? If you didn't know the, the image before. So why are we looking at this? Phase of structures everywhere. First of all, Fourier transform are difficult to interpret. They are not obvious apart from very simple examples. You can see here is lot, the amplitude of certain distribution. On the very small scale, there is more power. There is very little in the, in the largest modes, Why right? this is the modes. And so, uh, and so it's concentrating towards the zero mode, which if you want the zero mode is the, the average intensity on the map. And the phases are some stretch. Now, interestingly enough, you go back, and this is, sorry, you go back. You don't go back, so you go forward. Uh, I swapped this, but okay. On the left here is the image of the duct reconstructed using phase-only information. So you zero your amplitude, you transfer back phase, and you get this. On the right, there is the image of a duct where you zero the phase, and you just use the amplitude. What are we learning here? Well, we're learning that most of the information that we know about images, about our structure, and even the astronomical images, is in the phases, right? You don't see the duck very well, but if you look carefully, you can spot that there is a duck in there. Don't see the details. You miss the contrast a bit, the colors and all this, but, but, but you can say there is that. If you look at the amplitude, you can't say anything. That's because the amplitude is largely dominated by the average in the map, the zero component. So to say, and you have learned this in this week, that the phase information is very relevant to to, this, to, to preserve the information on the map, but more relevant than the amplitude. Well, in cosmology is, uh, ironically, completely the opposite. You just get rid of all these phases because, because that's what your theory kind of tells you. And you retain the amplitudes, and particularly retain the, the power, the square of the amplitudes. Now, not even the distribution, spatial distribution. So if I go back to this, it's the CMB. And again, right, I don't care whether this spot is here or there. My theory doesn't know this. This is an observation, so my observation does. If I take the power spectrum, that's what I get. I get a lot of structure opposite to, to the image that I showed before. And in these peaks, as a function of scale, there is just to impress upon you how, this, how relevant this is. Um, there is. There is essentially the history of our universe. We determine cosmological parameters by this little plot in here. We determine you know, like the matter content of the universe, how, how uh, quickly or, or slowly it expands, right? what the actual description of the geometry of the universe is, so the, the general relativity, and so on and so forth. We want to play this game exactly with this 21 centimeter. So we have essentially three observable, well, for, for this talk, two images and power spectrum. 
Why is this so relevant? Because interferometers are natural power spectrum instruments. This is the example of two element interferometer that you've seen in this week. So you have two elements in here. These two elements measure the brightness coming from the sky, essentially offset it by a relative delay between the two elements. The delay is a function of the antenna separation, okay? So they measure the coherency of the sky signal at the baseline separation. In other words, they measure this. If you call one and two, the visibility, you've seen this this week, is the Fourier transfer, right, of the brightness distribution of the sky I, essentially over the, with, with, with the, where the phase term is the baseline separation. And not just separation, also the orientation you've seen this week. Now, if I have a baseline like this and a baseline that's orient, like oriented 90 degrees, that's different. And we've been used the U and the V and the L and the M as coordinates. If you measure, why is this important? Because if the interferometer already you know, takes a Fourier transfer for you, well, then you're almost done, right? Then the only thing I need is I have a Fourier transfer. I just want to get rid of the phases and measure the amplitude. I multiply the visibility for this compass conjugate, and I got a power spectrum. Uh, I hope that this shows you that this with an interferometer is technically, at least in principle, very similar to, sorry, very simple to measure the power spectrum. At the power spectrum is measured at which, at which mode, at k coordinate, which is the length of your baseline vector. Okay. Um, so now, if I want to measure all the scales, I do something that is similar to imaging. This is, I hope you can see this quality is not as good as I hope to see in my, but you can lay down a few base, sorry, a few antennas here. If you can see at these circles, and you get the equivalent of the UV coverage here. This is in meters, U and V. If you lay down many more antennas, let's say in a pseudo-random way, you, you get a much more coverage in the UV space, which means you measure, man, you measure many more modes, and you can sample your power spectrum, like your function, on a much broad range of scales. It's, in this case, it's very similar to making an image. You just don't fully transfer back. You simply sample the distribution. So. Interferometers, well, you start off from visibilities, which are a function of the U and the V and the frequency. All modern interferometers measure visibility as a function of frequency. And this is extremely, uh, sorry, this is extremely uh, convenient for us because frequency maps directly into redshift. So if you measure like a thousand channels in your, in your correlator and instrument, right, you get immediately 1,000 different redshift slices. This is the frequency of your observation in megahertz. So this is how you, each frequency maps into a redshift. So in order to get a power spectrum, so, so you have two ways here, right? Either you do the standard approach where you have uh, the UV, UV coordinate, you fully transfer them, right? And you get an image cube that with Mirkan and, and any other observations that are familiar with, so you have angles as a function of frequency. Frequency again maps into redshift, and from these, right, and from and here you can actually measure the brightness distribution of your signal. Okay, well, so the evolution of the spatial distribution of the signal. You can make maps on the sky. The maps, the maps of the sky you make will be depending upon your UV coverage and so on and so forth. But in principle, that's one way to go. The other way to go is that, well, I already have two, as the 21 centimeter signal, like I said before, is a three dimensional quantity. So X, Y, and Z. So position, position, and redshift. So my visibility, so, so, so I can, so when I make a Fourier transfer, sorry, when I make a power spectrum, I make a three dimensional power spectrum. I already have Fourier transfer U and V. If I Fourier transfer on the frequency axis and I call it eta, Right, then I have, uh, well, gone into my coordinates. U, V, and E are not exactly K, but it doesn't matter. It's just a proportionality constant. So I can call my, we call this delay transform, this V with tilde, which is now no longer a function of U and V. It's a bit math thick, the slide, but it's useful, I mean, in my opinion, where I just fully transfer my visibilities again, along the frequency axis. So I do another free transfer. Now I have 
two coordinates, right? And I have one baseline length, which I recall the square root of u and v, u, and I call it k perpendicular. So essentially the, 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 the k mode that is on the plane of the sky. And then I have another k mode, which is parallel to the, perpendicular to the plane of the sky if you want along the frequency or redshift axis. And then I can construct two types of power spectrum as a function of k perpendicular and parallel, which is again the square root, sorry, uh, uh, the v times v square, v, v complex conjugate. Or I can finally construct a power spectrum that only depends upon my length of my vector. The k, and again, why I'm saying I'm using all these coordinates? Well, because it is relevant, because it shows us that in order to have the power spectrum as a function of a certain length, I can play with various coordinates in my observational space. Why? I, have, I no longer have only u and v, but I can also play with, with, with eta. So essentially, right? Uh, if I have imagined that you only have a single baseline, so u and v are fixed, you can still sample k, right? Taking several, well, many, several channels because f maps into eta, right? So if I take several channels, several frequency channels, so several redshift slices, I can still get my p of k distribution even in case of a single baseline. Obviously, there is a limitation to this game that I can play, right? But to show in principle that you can play, you can map this P of K from the observational standpoint by varying U, by varying V, and by varying eta. Right. Okay, so what does this Fourier transform function look like? Sorry, delay transfer function. So this three-dimensional Fourier transform. Well, that depends upon your signal. Just to give you an intuition, this again, there's a lot of details in here. This, and we enter in the real active research line. So this is the delay transform. You can see here is the, is the amplitude, actually, sorry, the, of the delay transform as a function here of delay. Remember, the delay is the conjugate of the, of the frequency, the Fourier conjugate of the frequency. In this case, it's a function of time. Just, just forget about this. It's not that relevant. Um, uh, but it's, it's a useful coordinate that we normally, uh, we normally use here to plot this. As a function of time, um, for, for a bunch of flat spectrum sources. Obviously here the frequency matters. So if your sources have a flat spectrum, when you take a Fourier transform, everything adds to the DC component, so the zero average. And so you can see that you have this intensity that here is confined to a certain maximum. This maximum is depending on the baseline. So this is a 15 meter baseline, this is a 30 meter baseline, this is an up to 60 meter baseline. Um, there is, I don't go a lot into the details in here, but I can do it later. Uh, there's a complicated, well, there is a very, a very information thick slide, despite the look. And uh, why I'm showing this? Because I want to show you here this, this uh, cyan or light blue area, which is the delay transform for a signal that is not flat spectrum, that has a lot of structure in frequency. It's a lot of structure, it's, it's got a lot of structure in delays. And so, uh, why is this relevant? Because this signal here, the cyan one, is the three-dimensional Fourier structure of Fourier transform, sorry, of a of a 21 centimeter signal of any from a cosmological perspective. And here instead are all the radios, what we call the foreground. Right? These lines are the foreground lines. And what are the foregrounds? Mark after me is going to give you the whole full picture of foreground, so I'm not going to say uh, too much about this. Oh, before I move to foreground, sorry, this is relevant for this. Um, uh, why have we been talking about representation? Well, because now we know, look at this bottom right here. This is a simple model of the amplitude of the 3D power spectrum as a function of uh, baseline length. Not exactly baseline length. It's either u or ne or eta, but let's, let's call it three-dimensional baseline length. Okay? And so... If you know what the signal looks like, you now you have different signals in here. They peak, well, I probably should have taken one that also peaks slightly later, but it gives you a, an idea of which baselines do you need to sample that. And if you look in here, the baselines are in meters, 300, 400, 500, and so on. So you need a very compact array, right? You don't need 
the kilometers and the and the and the and the tens of kilometers, you know, because there is essentially no signal in these, or very little on this scale. In a very compact way. So sorry, going back to foregrounds for a second. Foregrounds is all the stuff that is in between the signal, which is somewhere at redshift six and above, and us, which is when we are sitting in here. And um, again, Martha's going to tell you about this later. Uh, and a lot of work and a lot of effort from the observational pers perspective is to separate these two components. One way of separating them is, again, that's what I showed before. I showed you the delay transfer. Now I'm showing you another ways of looking at the three-dimensional Fourier transfer. It's the amplitude of our delay transfer or three-dimensional Fourier transfer, where I have here modes on, that are on the sky, essentially the baseline length. You can see at the top here, is k perpendicular, as I showed before, is proportional to the baseline length. And here I have the modes parallel to the line of sight or, 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 or perpendicular to the plane of the sky. And so here is the Fourier conjugate, if you like, of the redshift information. Why is this relevant? Well, because, yeah, I should have put the units, I forgot. Anyway, red and, and yellow, so apologies for this, is very bright. And blue is a few orders of magnitude from four to six fainter than the red and the yellow. So this is, this is, this, and Mark again is going to talk about this more. But what I would like to take away is that an interferometer is when you measure the power spectrum and you split this into dimensional power spectrum, is a natural instrument to separate foregrounds, which is all this emission here, from the high frequency, or if you want, cosmological emission that is expected to live somewhere here. In the delay transfer plot, let me go a couple of slides before, if I, ma if I manage. So in here, you will see, right, you will see that this cosmological signal spans quite a large range of delays. And this is true for, for essentially every baseline. So if I go here, that plot would be a vertical slice in here. So given a baseline, let's say a 20 meter baseline, I go down. And as you can see, the foregrounds occupy a very little uh, range in the K parallel mode. Uh, compared to, for instance, right, what we, well, all the correlate with K parallel model they can sample. This is less true for the longer baselines. So if I go to very short baselines, I have a region of space where we call the COR region where we expect to detect the signal. And most of the things we do is not really true, but at least most of the things we do in the, in, in the observation that I'm involved of, uh, uh, um, in, sorry, uh, is to uh, measure uh, with, with a series of baselines here, let's say something that goes between 0 to, to 80, 100 meters, right? And essentially throw away all this information and retain the far spectrum modes all in here. And then we just combine them together to, to improve the signal to noise to attempt it to a detection, right? So I've gave you a very, very short uh, description of exactly how observations proceed. I'll show in a second later. A very active line of research that I'll mention here, but it's important because you've heard a lot about this in this week, is that in order to preserve this description that allows you to hopefully detect the 21 centimeter signal, you need a very accurate calibration of your instrument. Very accurate calibration because every calibration error you make essentially reduces the width of this area because it takes power from the very bright part of the sky, the foregrounds, and throw this power into this area. So observationally, we essentially do two things. Integrate for very, very long and, and, and average the power spectrum and try to calibrate the instrument extremely accurately. It may sound like an easy job, but, but not that easy because we haven't really managed to take the UI yet. Anyway, uh, moving forward, now I want to give you a glimpse in the last few minutes I have of uh, observations, actual observations. Uh, this would deserve lectures alone, but I'm going to no, like give you again uh, some a taste of, of, of 
actual data. All this is what, what I think we needed in order to look at this now as an instrument and observation. So we have three, if I can say this without uh, disrespect to any other instrument, we have three main instruments working right now. One is called LOFA, you may have heard of this, it's the Low Frequency Array. It's located in mainly the Netherlands, but across Europe. You have an aerial view of the instrument here. It's, it's this, 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 the, the circle here is called the super turp. I uh, can't remember what it means in Dutch, but it doesn't matter. But it's, it's a 300 meter diameter wide circle. It's located in the Netherlands. And uh, if you wonder what the telescope looks like, well, it looks like this black box is in here. It's covered by some, can't remember exactly what uh, material, probably um, j just, just a plastic coverage to protect it from, from mainly humidity, if you want. And if you open these boxes, you have small dipoles in there that are clustered in this that we call stations. Each of the stations is, is a receiving element, the equivalent of a meerkat dish, if you want. And these are correlated, right, to form visibilities. Uh, there are also different receivers here, but let's not get into the nitty gritty details of LOFA, which are not relevant here. Uh, here you can see a UV coverage, an instantaneous UV coverage. This language hopefully is a bit familiar which is essentially given by the, the station layout. You know, the stations are these black things laid in here. There is a very dense core, which represents this part here. Again, why is a very dense core? You can see this is in kilometers. Well, because the very dense core, you want to measure the cosmological signal. At the same time, you have very long baselines, similar to Mirkin, because you want to do different science. You want to detect, observe radio galaxies. You want to, do, you, you want to resolve actual stuff in the sky. Okay. So, but the fact that the stations are laid down with a very diverse UV coverage help you measuring a lot of Fourier modes and making images. And you may can make images as well. I was about to say as nice as this. They are very nice, but probably the picture I showed is not. Uh, the, <laughs> doesn't really give full credit to that. You can see like an incredible amount of sources. This is like a six by six degree field in the sky. And you can see here, what we can see here at the center is what we call that there are so many sources that you are confused. You, know? you have like uh, the blue and the black, so the red and the blue here. And uh, they have, this is so crowded that you, know, you can actually have more than one source in a single resolution element. And if you can measure this as a function of, you measure this as a function of frequency between 100 to 200 megahertz approximately. It's a bit less, but okay. Then you do a bit of a machinery that Mark is going to tell you about uh, later, where you subtract all the stuff you don't want, and you come up with a power spectrum. It's the best power spectrum to measure so far. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a redshift 9, let's say, approximately. Uh, it's, it's this red line. Forget about all the other lines. The, the, sorry, red orange line is the interesting one. It's, uh, they didn't show here, but I wish they did. Uh, the fiducial 21 centimeter signal is below here, would be just below the scale. So still quite away from this. The relevant one is the noise here, which is this blue line. Why I'm saying the relevant one is because the noise tells you essentially, if you do the perfect job in subtracting everything, no, you can't subtract the noise, obviously. So that's your limit of what you can measure. And so, in principle, they could go as down as this. I don't go into the details as to why they, the, the observations are not noise limited. It's technical, it's technical stuff that doesn't matter here. But to show you some real taste of, you know, like from visibilities, you get actual data and you can turn them to an example of a power spectrum. Again, a lot of details uh, that we, uh, that are not, that are only relevant for people actually working in the field. Example number two. Just particularly dear to my heart is that that is the experiment I've been working on for a few years now. It's located in Kuru, and you can see here is this the view. You can see me in the background here, the dishes. It's called hydrogen Ionization array, and this is an array of 14 meter dishes, just laid on the ground, as you can see here, so not steerable. And uh, just just mm, don't have a time to go into the details, but essentially, it's uh, they are they are. Um, Anchored, they are yeah anchored to wooden poles, tall wooden poles you can see here, and there is a wide mesh you now laid on a 
uh, PVC structure and suspended out here. You don't see it here very well, but there is a feed. You know? and, uh, and they are laid out in a peculiar way in this hexagonal. You can see here, it's a bit outdated, but the black is the dishes that are actually laid out and the red are not, are the, the one to come. So, but, but the out, up to, sorry, a more updated picture will actually have most of them black. In a very peculiar layout in this hexagon grid, where you can see it's a very regular grid. They all spaced on a regular grid. And essentially they are 15 meter apart. They almost touch each other, right? On a very regular grid. Normally you don't do this. Uh, if you go back to your lecture about, about UV coverage, you know that this is disadvantageous because like, this baseline measures the same Fourier mode on the sky than this, and the same as this, and this too. So you're just essentially wasting your metal on the ground, you know, rather than orientating it in different directions and different you know, uh, separations. Uh, you just get the same information all over again. Well, like I said before, um, you can, why is this? There's very reasons why you do this. One reason is that. Okay, I only measure one UV mode, right? But I measured it incredibly well because I can average, essentially I get the same measurement all, all over again. And I can average in order to beat the noise down incredibly. How do I get resolution in K-space from the frequency dimension? So essentially we, with this array, we look at, at examples of the visual baselines and I'll show you here again. This is, again, the three-dimensional delay transfer, the amplitude of that. And that's, that's the signal we look at. You know? We look at something that, again, as a function of, this is a transit instrument, so you don't really track a single direction on the sky, and that's why there is the LST here. So there is the, we have measurements at different times, so that's why the time axis here. We have K-modes in here. We have, again, it doesn't matter the left and the right, it's just a different way of treating you're calibrating your visibilities, but you look at the right, it is clean or cleaner then. You can see very, very, very much emission here, which is called, again, what we call the foreground. Very noise like here, which is where we would like again to go deep and integrate for the R. So we fully transfer a lot of baselines, we average them together. I'm going a bit simple here. And that's what, and, and we look at these and we produce these plots. And we produce these plots until we hope to see popping up here a signal. A third one, I'm not going to talk about in details, is the MWA, but it deserves a mention because it's um, uh, not, I, I like it, I'm running out of time, so I knew I was running out of time. Uh, the MWA combines a bit of a loafer and the hair. Uh, if you can see here, this is a, it's a sample of a station, it's in Western Australia. The MWA has got this hybrid array configuration where the stations are laid out in a, in a very, well, in a pseudo-random configuration but also in two large hexagons here, like hair, for instance. So this part is like loafer and this part is like hair. So you get a bit of both, okay? With the pros and the cons. Uh, I don't go into details of the pros and the cons now, but so what you say is that you can do the hair thing where you don't make it, you don't even make images of the sky, you just take the visibilities, free transfer on the frequency axis and integrate that down. Or you go the loafer way where you can actually do images of the sky, right? Subtract or some do some subtract whatever you don't want, and on your residual image, you do a 3D free transfer back into power spectrum. Finally, where do we stand? Well, we stand still far away. That's my recap of the observations. And it's a power spectrum now. So the amplitude of your power spectrum here, uh, really as a function of, of K, no, is a function of redshift. Uh, the redshift information is useful. So, so the K-modes, it's, 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 it's difficult. I should plot it in the 3D. We don't really have an easy way to visualize this. So each point is slightly different K-mode, um, uh, but it's a different redshift. As you can see, a collection of all the pictures, uh, sorry, the measurements in the literature started from the early one up in here to the more recent ones. So the, the lower point, which is the deepest one, or they say they are the lower points in here, the deepest one is this little dot here. This is about 10 to the, 10 to the 4. Uh, there, is, there are the MWA ones, particularly the, the, the blue asterisks here, 
that they go all the way to redshift six and a half or so, almost 10 to three. And these two uh, purple uh, uh, down pointing triangles are the HERA one. You know, our best measurements so far, they are not published yet. So that's why it's preliminary. And so like I was saying, we measure that in two redshift bins, one, the deepest one so far at redshift eight, uh, well, yeah, slightly over, well, sorry, eight, uh, 7.9, uh, slightly below 10 to the three. Uh, why I'm showing this, well, to give you like the uh, overview of where we stand, these are the some of the 21 centimeter models, these lines below. You can see they're still far away from, from models, but, but our constraints has to become interesting, particularly if you take this point, again, it's, uh, it's not published yet, it's still under, uh, when it's in prep, if you want to run the review. Anastasia must have shown, I don't remember, I think he must have shown like the bright, how the brightness temperature depends upon parameters. So you would like to constrain the neutral fraction, or these are the direct measurements you can do of the intergalactic medium, or the temperature of the gas, right? The temperature of the gas in this D spin. So if this spin is very low, this number, this fraction goes high, and these curves go high. So if you have these measurements, you can constrain how cold or warm, if you want, the, the intergalactic medium is. And, uh, and this says that the, our measurements say that the intergalactic gas needs to be warmer than a couple of Kelvin, which is not a tremendously interesting result from the theory standpoint. Anastasia will tell you this. But it's really, but it's real, it is real world evidence that there were sources that heated the intergalactic gas already at very high redshift, before redshift eight, let's say. And what the sources are, we don't know, we'll figure it out. So I'll just leave it with this and uh, just to let you know that stand, but the journey is continuing. And for, uh, and this, as this is a lecture, is a bit of an ad. If you're interested in looking at, sorry, in working in something that's cutting edge, there are many cutting edge things. So um, I don't want to be unfair towards other efforts, but uh, it is a very intriguing uh, high redshift, uh, uh, or let's say cosmology, I would say, field uh, that you can do actually only with, with radio astronomy. Thank you.